Um, hello, everyone. This is Alex Lenderman. Um, yeah, so um, for a while I was giving you classes on uh, either my games or some strong GM level games. Uh, today I decided to do something a bit different and maybe a bit more fun. I wanted to bring kind of um, bring myself back to when I was a kid also and um, kind of kid roughly your levels. So somewhere around between 22 and um, 2300. And uh, why I think this is important is because you'll see how it's important how to be able to, let's say, recognize your weaknesses at an early level, how to be able to recognize the patterns. And that way you know what to work on and, um, you know, and, uh, and then become a better player by, by doing that. So um, the first game I want to show is the game I played with White against uh, International Master Jay Bone. So as you could see with my FIDA rating, it's 2180 here. I was around USCF Master. So, you know, roughly your level player. So let's see how, how I was different back then than from the way I play now. Okay, so I was white. So this was game 30, but still this was a good sample game because it kind of um, illustrates, um, because it's not like I blundered anything, it was just positional mistakes. So let's, let's get to it. So I was white. Yeah, and my opponent played a weird opening. He was known to, he's known to sometimes playing uh, sidelines to try to confuse his opponents. Here, G4 is actually pretty interesting to really go for the initiative, given that black is underdeveloped. But okay, I mean, bishop e2 is... Um... Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, he, he sometimes does c6 and then a6 even. Yeah, with even... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so h3, bishop h5, um, a4. Okay, I wanted to stop b5. Not, not the best move, but not the worst move either. Um, knight d7, bishop e2, bishop takes, bishop takes, e5. <clears throat> and here, uh, the first question, very simple question. Um, <clears throat> so um, there are four moves that white could consider here. d5, d takes e5, bishop e3, and castles. So the question is, which of these four moves we should not play? Which of these moves we should not play? So once again, d5, d takes, bishop e3. Uh, make sure you guys type it to me um, in the chat, not to everyone, please. Um, uh, okay. Some people are saying de, some people are saying d5. So all of you agree that we should not release the tension with the poem. Uh, okay, most of you got it, of course. Yeah, of course, white should not play d takes e5 because that helps the bishop develop. And it also gives up control over the center, right? Because by playing de, we're trading off d4 form, d4 form for the d6 form, right? We definitely don't want to do that, right? So that's a very bad idea. So d5 is a very reasonable move, gaining some space, preparing to castle. White's clearly better here with the bishop pair in the space. Also castle and bishop e3 are, are normal moves. But for whatever reason, I guess I didn't have the concept of like controlling the center at that point or fighting for the center. I was like more of a just a tactical player. Didn't really care so much about strategical moments and I just played d takes e5. A very bad move, of course. Lost a big part of my advantage. Yeah, he took d, takes e5, <clears throat> castles, a5. <clears throat> okay, now this is a more serious moment. So this is actually a more serious question. What plan would you choose here? This is actually something that uh, not a lot of people will find. It's not so easy. White still is better, but he needs to find the right plan. But of course, the advantage has minimized. It was plus minus, now it's around plus equals, but still, what would be the plan? <laughs> what should be White's plan?
All right, so I see a lot of people want to improve the bishop on f3, which uh, I guess could make sense. Uh, see if any any other ideas. Trade off the knight, okay, so bishop takes d7 somehow, okay. Okay, everybody seems to want to move the bishop on f3. Okay, queen e2, rook d1, bishop e3. And so far, no one got the, the idea that um, I think is the best that the engine suggests. Um, we'll look at all of these ideas, like bishop e2, bishop g4, but um, bishop g2, king f4, okay. I mean, this is also knight e2, knight g3. Okay, let's see what anyone else. Yeah, so far, yeah, this, so this one is a, is a tough one. Because uh, so far, B3 we have, H4, okay. Let's see. Mm. Bishop G4, Bishop D7. Somehow get Knight to D6. Okay, that's, that's, here you're very close. Okay, now we're finding the right idea, yes. Carlos, yes, you got it. Uh, actually, let me uh, go ahead and unmute Carlos, and let's see if uh, where is Carlos? Uh, yeah, it's always hard to find so many people. Uh, Carlos Valera, where are you? I can't find can't find you somehow. Mm. I, I unmute myself. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so go ahead, uh, share your idea. Yeah, uh, I play knight b1 uh, to like relocate the knight to d2 and maybe to c4 because mm -hmm. it is pretty good. And I can do, I don't know, to e3, to e2, to f5, or controlling the b6 square and like. Uh, control because the knight on c3 is very bad because it cannot go to d5 and it isn't controlling at all our squares and in c4 is pretty good yep very good exactly excellent job yeah so uh another thing we have to keep in mind and that's something that at some point i was taught by my coach uh georgi kachishvili he mentioned how it's very important um that um when there, whenever there are no pawns on the D file, um, you have to make sure um, the most important squares to control are C4 and C5. If you control these two squares, um, white will usually um, be better. So remember, when there are no D pawns on the board, the C4 and the C5 squares actually become the most important. Of course, at that point, I had no idea, right? I was uh, very weak strategical player. But now hopefully I'll be able to figure out knight on b1 is bad and I need to relocate it to try to get to c4. So knight b1 is very decent and also queen e2, knight here, followed by knight d1, knight e3, knight c4. It's very reasonable. But the point is we need to try to bring the knight to c4 and uh, and then you know we can see if we, where we're gonna develop the bishop on c1. We might bring it to c3, e3, b2 right bishop has flexibility the one on c1 but the knight for sure the square is c4 because for example if we go here and there it's going to be restricted um by pawn on g6 and several of you suggested moving the bishop but this i don't think really leads to very much because i can go here castle and uh, at some point you might even give up um um, give up the e e five e five square with like e six f four and and stuff like that. Um, and f five is also you know nothing so special. And black is completely fine. So the thing is, you know, it looks like white is ahead in development, needs to try to get initiative, but it's not easy to really gain initiative because anytime you play f four, black just goes bishop c five, and black is completely fine. Um, G three bishop g two probably is the most interesting of these, but still it's um, it's nothing that special. It's just a, it's just a fight. Um, but yeah, re repositioning the knight and then deciding what to do with other pieces would be a very 
good plan, right? And then you can try to see what to do with the bishop. Also, bishop e2, knight of six, bishop c4 was suggested. But then I think, again, we go bishop c5, castles, and again, it's nothing special. The knight on c3 is still not very good. The bishop on c4 maybe could get attacked at some point. So this also looks completely fine for black. Um, yeah, but I played bishop e3. And uh, the reason this move is not so great is because I'm just encouraging bishop c5, exchange of bishops. So right away, I'm just losing my bishop pair. So it looks like a natural thing to do. Okay, let's just develop. But, um, but of course, um, in this case, um, I just have to trade off the bishop, right? So it's no, no real use. And eventually, you know, we play this position and um, black is, you know, it's equal, comfortably equal. A little bit easier to play for black, I would say. And eventually he was able to uh, to equalize. I mean, outplay me. I didn't play very precisely, and eventually he found a plan to grind me down. 98, 96, b5, and he makes the pass pawn. I ended up playing b4, and you know the rest is pretty straightforward. Reposition the knight, and he got back here, and okay, the rest is pretty simple. All righty, so that was the first game I wanted to show you. Let's look at some more. Uh, this was a game 30, but let's see how I would play long games. And of course, I don't have really these games saved. I just found them from the database. <laughs> Luckily, these games made the database because of course I lost all my score sheets from back then. I was not a very responsible player. So yeah, this one I was, I was black. Um, so you guys should try to be responsible with your score sheets and you know keep the game scores so that you know you will be able to uh, reflect on them later on. But thankfully, at least I could find the ones in the database. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So this game, I didn't really know the opening all that well, and uh, got a slightly worse position. Well, yes, yes. Now there is a chess space. Back then, I don't. Okay, I guess there was already chess space, but like, you know, it's it was like, uh, like it was two thousand three or something. So, you know, the engines were. I guess there was chess space, but I didn't really use it that much until two thousand five, two thousand six. Um, but um, okay, so. <laughs> Uh, that's funny, yeah. Okay, so here, I guess the question is what to do with the black. Should we play take on d4 or should we play bishop somewhere? What would be bishop a7, let's see. Again, pretty simple question. Okay, let's get back on, on target here. Bishop a7 or, or take? Which one is better? Take and then bishop a7, bishop or bishop a7. Rook opens up. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so um, I believe the correct answer is bishop a7 immediately because uh, I think in this case, this rook, there's not that much you can do on that e file. And also, it opens up the e file for him. But again, the main problem here is after bishop a7, you're, I mean, after e takes d4, I mean, is that you're opening up his bishop. It can now go to g5, e3, right? You're helping his bishop develop. So again, you're exchanging e pawn for e pawn, right? So something you don't really want to do, right? So again, I did the same kind of thing as I did it against j Bonin. Um, so the correct idea is, Bishop a7. One second, Austin, I'll answer your question. Bishop a7, and then something like knight e7, c6, and bishop b8. And, you know, to relocate the bishop, and black has decent control over the center. In fact, Varakobian once outplayed me in a stru structure like this uh, at the US Championship playoff in 2014. On the black side, he was. Uh, so you can check that game if you want. Uh, it wasn't exactly this line, but very similar. Um, but uh, yeah, this one is not 
um, as good. And yeah, you're saying something bishop of five without e4. I'm, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess. I, I, I mean, maybe. But the thing is, um, I think white just gets more. Like he gets like 95 and a lot. I think white just gets more. You know, yeah, bishop of five, I guess it, it's there, but I think the fact that we're helping the bishop develop, I think it's not, not such a such a good thing. Okay, I can turn on the engine and you guys will see. Uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, bishop a7 is a little bit better. Although he takes, yeah, of course I should have probably played here. Um, then b3, let's say. Uh, bishop f5. H6. Yeah, I guess there's always king h2, so or g4. So the bishop on f5 is not exactly stable either. And h5 looks at it always bishop g5. So it's not it's not that convincing. Um, but uh, okay, I understand your reasoning, but I think probably still better not to open up his bishop on c1. Um, okay. Because also the thing is if you ever play e4, there's um uh, this bishop gets opened up, right? So there's like e4 still has a drawback in these positions. I think pieces are is still the most important in chess. So I ended up taking, and here after bishop g5, he would have gotten like much better position. And that's kind of what happened. He got a much better structure here. Okay, later on I managed to trick him and, and beat I and I won, but that's beyond the point. Uh, position is strategically almost waiting for you. I have all these bad light squares and he has a very strong bishop on g2, so it's not very good. But what I was always good at is I managed to create some tricks, uh, like rook c8, then I played a4, you know, like if this, knight a5. So I was good at finding these little cheap ideas, right? I was strategically not very sound, but I was a very good practical player at that time. Yeah, and here he kind of had to calculate some lines, but he didn't manage to find the best idea. He was also just 2200, so he he obviously gave chances. Yeah, game is like complicated. And like around here, he was still much better or winning with like knight takes c8 or queen a5, but he played the uh, wrong move, knight takes a5, and uh, I guess he blundered. Uh, this uh, rook c1 followed by queen f2. And then uh, I go a2 and a. So yeah, he just, I think he might have been in time pressure and he blundered and, okay, he played this and then I went here and then I won. So that's how I would win a lot of my games at that time, right? That's like strategically not great, but then I would swindle people. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's see the next game. Again, it's a game I won, but again, game where we should definitely be critical of, of how I played. Um, okay, some of you might play this. So do you guys know what the best move for white is here? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh shoot, I didn't you. Oh, it's okay. Uh, Sorry, I forgot this is... Uh... Mm -hmm. I see. <clears throat> okay, looks like you guys know this. Yeah, it's okay, don't worry. Queen d3, so. <laughs> Queen d3 is correct move, yeah. Okay, at that point, I didn't know the theory. Queen d3 is the best move. e5, I think, is not as good because you can go knight e4. And bishop g5, that's a mistake because I can take and go queen a5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, queen d3 is a strong move. Okay, anyway, that's a little bit of an opening. So I play queen c2, knight c6, takes, takes. All right, what do you guys think white should do now? Okay, looks like you guys are correct. Yeah, e5, white should, of course, challenge the center. 
Yeah, and why does better in these lines? Knight g4, a3, bishop c5, knight e4, and white ends up being better because if knight e5, you have castles and bishop e5, rook d1. So black is kind of behind on development. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So this looks, uh, yeah, e5 was very strong. Even a3 is not bad, but e5, I think, is the strongest. Yeah, I played bishop g5, which is not so good. It's a very kind of a lazy move. And uh, <laughs> I, have, I made a lot of these kind of moves. I still make a lot of these moves now, but especially as a, as a kid, I made these moves a lot. <laughs> just, just, you know, let's just develop a piece, you know, without thinking long term. Yeah, so a3, bishop e7. Rook d1, queen c7, bishop e2, bishop e6, castles, castles, knight a4, b6, bishop e3, rook knight d7. Okay, my opponent played like not the best moves here. So the question is, what should white do here? Um... Mr. Man, can Joshua, can you, Joshua Man, can you unmute yourself? I can't seem to find you on Zoom again. Uh, to unmute. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, explain your, your answer. Okay, so my move was rook takes d7. Mm -hmm. So pretty much giving up the piece, uh, the rook for uh, um, the knight and a pawn, and you get like a lot of long term compensation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah, because bishop takes d7, you go knight b6, and after rook e8, you go c5. Yeah, and uh, what's happening, knight on b6 is very strong. It kind of dominates um, the rook. And uh, and then we're going e4, rook e1, and uh, potentially threatening on a6. And, uh, yeah, the compensation is very strong, you know. Uh, in fact, um, sacrificing... Uh, Pawn for exchange is uh, usually um, exchange for a pawn is usually, you know, it's like sacrificing less than a pawn. But especially in a position like this, where he can't really use open files out for the rook, exactly, you can't really use it. So that's why this is very good for white. Yeah, again, these are the kinds of things I didn't really understand at that time. So I played c5 would also be some advantage. But I just played very prosaically, like rook d2, rook c8, rook d1, a very kind of straightforward chess. And um, and now I played for a tactic, knight d5, but here it's actually not as good. Bishop d8, c5, and I think I sort of blundered here, like I might have missed a five here. Yeah, because he's threatening a four. So um, like I could have still played knight d6, and sacrificing the spawn, but uh, I ended up playing uh, f3, and I might have missed bishop f5, so I think I was blundering in this game also a few things, and, uh, and here I played c6, so I kind of, you know, thought practical chance, and now I guess the question is, should we take um, c2, or should we, you know, do something else? Take on C2 or do something else. Well, actually, at right this moment, he blundered and I was already better. So it's, uh, it's still a tricky position. If you don't find the right idea, if you, you don't find the right move, then you're, you know, you're going to be not better. So... Bishop b6 and rook c2 look good. Okay, well, <laughs> one of these moves, you have to choose one of these moves because, you know, these two moves aren't meant to like. Yeah, let's not be lazy here, you know. It's, uh, we have to uh, calculate. Uh, okay, so we have queen a8, knight b8. Okay, so it seems like nobody wants to take on c2. Does anyone want to take on c2?
Okay, people want bishop b6 now. Okay. <laughs> Pin is mightier than a sword. It's funny. Okay, so here's the thing, right? Like if you play, oh, like, I don't know, queen a8, queen c7, you know, white will probably go bishop d3. And in this case, um, I'll have compensation for the piece. I mean, I'll have two monstrous pawns. And with these two pawns, it's going to be very hard for you to play. I mean, maybe you're not worse, but white will definitely have a lot of compensation here. So moves like that are not convincing at all. White will definitely have a lot of play here. Will he be better? I don't know, but he'll have a lot of play. However, the first move you should calculate in such position is bishop c2, you know, principal move. You know, what happens if you actually just take on c2? Um, because now taking the queen is more or less forced. Now the bond structure gets messed up. So if concretely this, this works, then, then black will be completely fine. Right, and here it turns out you can go rook c7. And after d6, you can go rook c6. Now the c6 square is free. And after rook c1, you have bishop e4. Concrete, bishop e4. And black wins. Black is winning. However, you needed to calculate until bishop e4. Because if you don't see bishop e4, it's not so easy. So you have to kind of always check the most obvious move, right? Without stopping the variation too soon, right? But I think my opponent, maybe he trusted me a little bit. Maybe he just didn't trust his calculation a lot. And he ended up going bishop b6, which is also a very, very interesting try. And I didn't see bishop b6, by the way. But uh, luckily for me, I had uh, a strong continuation. So who, who wants to try to find what white should do here? Well, Sefri, you should not have said it to everyone, but... Um, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Of course, that's it's queen f five. Queen f five, and uh, and what happens after bishop f two? All right. Let's get back on focus. Yes, king f one. Of course. Yeah, king of king of two would be queen b six. Yes. So king of one. And uh, now white is getting the piece back, and uh, it's white who ends up being better because he has the pass pawn. He has the open file, and black spawns are not going anywhere. So rook f6. And now, what should white's plan be going forward? How would you try to convert this? Because here I was converting this position very badly. Okay, so I think people are getting it right. The best way is to play d6. And uh, yes, you do want to stack the bishop to e4, but it's better to play d6 first because otherwise your passed pawn could be blocked with some rook d6. So let's play d6, ensure that that bishop will not get stopped. And then we have also rook c7 idea. And white is winning, more. For example, this move is meant by rook c7, which is a very important tactical point. If the knight moves, we have d7. And uh, yeah, it's very hard for black to find anything great to do. Uh, white is winning pretty much easily. Like you have right here, like rook c6 and rook c7. Bishop comes to the game. And, uh, effectively, white's like a pawn up because black can't really use his majority right now. And black's pieces are uncoordinated. But this move is actually very bad. It blows a big part of my advantage. Because now after rook b6, it's um, not as easy. My pawn gets located. Rook c1, king f7, and now I made uh, a horrible move. I played rook takes b6. Uh, I should have still played something like this and rook c6. And still I have like a dominating position. Why on earth I decided to exchange my active rook for his passive rook, I have no idea. So very bad, right? It's uh, not really thinking about, uh, let's say, consequences of trading, right? And in, because in chess, every time you exchange a piece, right, you're changing the course of the game. So you have to always take some time and try to really weigh the pros and cons, you know, about such a decision. 
But here I just played a very lazy move. Rook takes b6, and I figured it's not a blunder. How bad can it be? But yes, it can be very bad. And in fact, very often, you know, if those of you who study games with the engine, sometimes a positional mistake, a serious positional mistake, strategical mistake, could be worse than, let's say, hanging a pawn or even hanging a piece. Sometimes you, if you make a very bad positional move, you can, it can go from, let's say, plus two, plus three in your favor to like minus one in his favor. You know, it uh, happens a lot in chess. Um, so h4, king e7, h5, <clears throat> knight of six, takes, takes, and now bishop e4, g5. This was already fine for him. But here I'm still trying to win. And uh, I should still play rook c8, but I played rook g7. Mistake, g4. Now his king gets in, <clears throat> into d4, and my pawn is still getting located. So this is uh, getting worse and worse. And I really started to feel like something is like going a bit wrong. Okay, I played king e2. And here, um, if he plays the right move, for example, rook d6, uh, this is uh, winning for him. Like he's gonna go g3 at some point, king d4, threatening knight d4. Black is winning here. It's like minus three according to the engine. <laughs> uh, yeah. G3 first, yeah, maybe that works too. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, but uh, here I was lucky. He played knight takes e4. I can turn on the engine. You'll see if you don't believe me. I'll turn on the engine. You see, minus, uh, yeah, minus three. Uh, G3, uh, yeah, G3 is also uh, decent, uh, but you know, there's King D3 maybe. Yeah, so for some reason, this is a little bit stronger because after this, there's naive four. So I guess this is better because it also creates a threat. Yeah, yeah, so this is, yeah, so anyway. Uh, so rook d6 was um, was very strong. Um, yeah, he played knight e4, the b4, and he can still fight with king d4, but he blundered twice. <laughs> yeah, I guess he just got tired, and uh, and he just lost, right? So that was that was how I was winning games when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> so you know, you could see why these games are actually instructive. Yeah, actually. Um, well, the interesting thing is, I, I, that's looking at looking back at these games. I start to believe that perhaps the level of chess has just gotten much higher. I think, I really think that 2200 P day back into that 20 years ago when I was a kid is roughly equivalent to around 2000 now. That's what I, I firmly think. Um, well, now there's also the pandemic, but that's that's different, whole different animal. But I'm saying even. Like let's say 2019, you know, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so okay, so let's continue. Let's look at the next game. Um, okay, this game I also won. Um, but the opening I didn't play so well. I didn't really know the opening so well. So I played this, which is fine, but here I didn't really know what to do. And I played knight c6. Yeah, I played against Catalan this game. I think I barely knew what it, what it even was. <laughs> At that time, I didn't really know openings very well. Uh, queen takes c4, queen d5. At that time, I had very bad openings. Uh, queen d5. Queen d3. First of all, this is 2200 p day, and uh, uh, this is 2100 years CF. Uh, okay, so queen d3. Again, I abandoned the center kind of very easily, uh, which was bad. And then I played some more dubious chess. I kind of gave up the bishop pair. I should have at least gone queen h5. But anyway, I wanted to get to the to the fun part where I swindled the guy. <laughs> uh, finally enough, in this tournament, I got my first IM lore. This was a tournament in, in Hungary. Uh, 
I, I won a lot of games like this and I ended up getting an IM norm, uh, my first one, even though it was 2200 uh, fee day. So anyway, clearly, as you could see, he's completely outplaying me. He has two bishops and now he's winning the exchange. So clearly it's like getting worse and worse. Um, but, uh, okay, soon we're gonna get to a critical moment. Uh, okay, let's stop here. Okay, what would you guys would do here? Uh, so you have a winning position, you know that you're winning. How would you try to convert this? No, this up to here, he played fine, but this is where he first, this is where he made, uh, this is where he made a mistake. Obviously, knight takes c7 is tempting, so it's a move you should consider. All right, let's stay on target, please. You can, you guys can talk about this other stuff later. Let's please stay on topic. Let's try to find the best idea for white here. Okay, so a lot of people want to win nine takes c seven. So let's that's actually what my opponent played, and we'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, let's see if anyone gave a right idea yet. Um, maybe just a four. So I think uh, what Austin is saying, maybe he's right. Maybe a four immediately was uh, the most practical move. But I think here, if you play a four. Um, I guess you can play d4, at least to try to activate uh, the bishop. And after this move, maybe bishop e5. Somehow it feels like black is getting a little bit of counterplay. Maybe also c5. One takes knight c6. It doesn't look that bad anymore, at least. So I think there's, um, there's a little bit better option. And, you know, you kind of don't, you know, want to just get, get b5, right? So... Um, I don't think anyone has found this idea. Okay, it looks like Megan found it, but yeah, please don't type it to everyone, but let's let's call on her, unmute. Well, I think Rook G3 trying to have some background like mate, mating mm -hmm. and because it's it's like hard to defend it. Yes. So, very. Yeah, keep going. So like uh because the way the only way to try to defend the example if he plays bishop a8 bishop a8 rook g8 king b7 and then there's like knight d8 right yeah that's very ugly for black um yeah for sure yeah rook g3 would have been very strong i think i would have put king b8 to try to free the c8 where but still after check and then knight goes back to d4 now there is no more counter play with rook g7 Rook e8, you know, I, he, he should win very easily. This is just complete domination. So yeah, rook g3, in general, you should first always look at forcing moves before positional moves. So knight takes c7 and rook g3, I would first calculate. If these moves don't work, then I would look at, at other moves. But uh, yeah, rook g3 was very strong. He played knight takes c7. It's still winning, but it's already getting messy. Uh, what do you guys, what do you guys think black should do now? So let's try to find, um, uh, counter chances for, for black. Bishop c6, I don't think would good, be good because takes rook c7, rook e8. Uh, and please don't type it to everyone. Please type it directly to me. We don't want everyone to get the answer. 
Uh, if you play t4 immediately, I don't think that works because I give a check, and then I can take, and then I can give check, right? So that should be, maybe there's even something better. Oh yeah, there's 96 even. Yeah, so that's just, uh, that's just loses t4. King d8 also loses pretty easily because check and knight c5, that's not. Uh, rook c7 does not work because then we give a check and then we give this check and then we take here. And that's more or less losing pretty routinely. Take, take on b7, take on b6, that should not be a very right. Um, but black has an, black has a good idea. Let's see if anyone found it. So far, nobody has found it, I think. King b8, no, then just rook e8, and then knight a6. It's just kind of still losing. If, if, if black has to play move, king move or something passive, then knight c7 would have just been game over, and then would be end of discussion. But uh, uh, how about... Uh, let me call on Austin for a second. Austin, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. My idea was to play rook g7, and he can't play king h1 because d4. So he has to play king f1, but then we can play d4 anyways. And then if rook e8 check, we can play king d7. Very good, exactly. And that's like, that's why I call on you. I wanted you to also demonstrate this d4 idea. Yeah, so that's the whole point. You play rook g7 first, and then you play d4. Uh, Austin, are, can you... Can you tell us also what to do after rook c4? Bishop g2, king e2, and then you can take the knight. Very good. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because after king g1, you, you go here, and after king e2, you take here. And that's actually what he blundered. So rook c4 was already a losing move. He was still winning here, but he had to find the... Uh, 96 was not so clear. This was messy. Because I'm getting past pawns, I have this bishop, this would be tricky. But uh, rook e8 and rook d8 was uh, was the way to play. Because then he can play rook c7 and rook g7. But you see, this is already like much harder than than like the win he had earlier with rook g3. So you see how if you miss the first idea, then it gets harder and harder. And now he played rook c4 and you know, he missed this trick. You know, and now he's suddenly, he's suddenly losing. You know, and uh, by a miracle, and now I was able to convert this uh, <laughs> little by little. Yeah, and from actually, the engine was pretty happy with my technique. So I wasn't sure, but you know, I was pretty happy that at least the conversion was good. So that's actually something I also always did pretty well. Uh, Winning positions, I would usually be, uh, would have been pretty good. I mean, I usually was pretty good at converting winning positions. Okay, let's continue. Uh, this game I want to skip. Yeah, the, now I want to show you a loss I had. And uh, this loss also kind of exemplifies of how I was at that, at that level. So I used to actually play Kings Indian sometimes. I mean, actually, as a kid, King's Indian was my main opening. And I think after this game, actually, I lost another game in the same tournament in the King's Indian. And then I lost this game. And after that tournament, I actually quit the King's Indian, which maybe in retrospect was a mistake. Maybe I should have kept playing and then kept developing my dynamic senses, which now I feel like I, I'm seriously lacking at. Um, but yeah, because clearly the problem wasn't necessarily the opening, it was just like my way of thinking at certain positions. Now, in this in this position, what do you guys think uh, Black's plan should typically be? Um, well, nowadays, it's actually harder to play Kings Indian because there's just people prepare so much, right? And it's like, you know, but the thing is, it's uh, I, I quit it like completely, right? It's it might like say make sense not to play only it, right? Because in normal events, obviously people will prepare. So if you only play one opening, you're like a little bit of a sitting duck, especially if you play like same line there. Um, but um, the problem is I quit it completely, right? And that maybe was uh, was a mistake. H three G four H three G four. I don't know. Actually, I think there black 
gets an uh, interesting fight. Mm, but okay, that's already an opening discussion. I don't like opening discussions here. Um, oh, I mean, I'm not a King's Indian expert by any means, but uh, but I actually learned to appreciate it more now than, than I did in the past. I used to think it was just completely bad opening, but I have friends who play it very successfully and uh, they make me believe that it's actually not so bad. And Fabi recently beat me at the US Championship with it. So what do I know? So it's still not bad for us to win games. Um, okay, so what do you guys think Black should play here? Yeah, e6 or b5, right? Um, I think um, I think somebody said, few people said e6. Uh, b5 is also reasonable, Some something like that. Yeah, I mean, b5 I think is very reasonable. Like trying to play like a Banco. Or e6 is actually the main line. To try to take, and then maybe play queen a5, right? Something like that, I have to challenge the center, activate my pieces and play like a Benoni structure. And black should be okay. I don't know if you should include h6 or not, but either way, something along those lines. Well, Benoni structure, I'm talking about like if he takes takes. I'm not saying like bishop should be in g5 and Benoni, although sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. there are lines with the bishop on g5. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, could be either way, right? But either, but I mean, it's probably okay for, for, um, for black. Anyway, so I played queen a5. Bishop d2, not such a good idea. And now I played knight a6. So I kind of just didn't do anything with that center. I just kind of let it sit there. And as a result, you know, I just tried to, okay, do something, but I simply gave up the center, let him play e5, let him go bishop f4. And um, now he went knight b5, and he just, uh, he's just squeezing me. Just got a lost position, just didn't lost without counterplay. Um, you know, now e7 became very weak, knight on e6 was misplaced, and I just didn't manage to create counterplay, right? And usually in chess, when you have a space disadvantage, you have to create counterplay. You have to do something, challenge the center and uh, activate your pieces, but I didn't do that, right? And, and that's why I just lost very badly. And I lost to a guy who was like in last place too, you know, and which is, yeah, which was of course, um, very bad. Okay, so let's see another game. Um, so these games will skip. Uh, okay, this one actually is uh, with, is, is an instructive one. Um, this was a game I played at the World Youth Championship. Um, and I played against... Um, you know, future GM. This guy's also future GM. It's around 25, 2600 now. Linchevsky from Russia. Um, yeah, we actually played a theoretic line in the, in the session cup. And here he played a little bit of a sideline with bishop e6. Of course, the main line is b5. He played bishop e6. It's actually playable. Um, knight c4, rook c8. Maybe that's actually not the best move, but okay, I don't want to dive into theory here. Bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, knight, knight b6. Yeah, so here I got a big advantage. Um, c3, g6. Okay, uh, critical moment here. What should I do here? My opponent kind of misplayed the opening. Let's try to find the best, best way to get an advantage. Naranyan Venkatesh, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, okay. Um, so Queen A4 uh, was what I was thinking because it just, because you're threatening something like Bishop A6 next. And yep. uh, it's, it's just hard to, uh, and if you play something like Bishop D7, you just take and Queen cannot take because of Knight F6. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's actually that simple. It's very hard to 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 deal with this move. Yeah. So um okay, bishop g7 maybe, but still you can take, take, and I think it's knight d5, rook a8. Um yeah, it might be queen b5. I mean you have to do a little calculation here, but 
it kind of works well for a white. Yeah. So the bad thing is, I remember like my coach there, Avi Friedman, was asking you know me about Queen A4, and I just somehow didn't even look at it. Somehow didn't even consider. So you have to always consider tactical ideas, especially if your opponent is uh, underdeveloped. That's a very, very important lesson. I mean, there are certainly many good positional ideas here. Like the move I played is not bad also, bishop c4. Um, but uh, queen a4 was a kind of a golden opportunity to like already get like a nearly winning position. 2200 as black, really? Well, I mean, back then, you know, people didn't really know theory as well. And, you know, he just, you know, he didn't know the opening that deeply, right? He he kind of played a little bit over the board. And actually, Russians, um, when they're younger, they are taught not so much openings, but just how to play chess in general, right? And they kind of learn openings a bit later. So that's that's why, you know, he, you know, it makes sense. He was like this. And especially back in the day, people didn't have as good prep as, as now in general. So that was because the computers were very weak. And some people didn't, you know, have computers. So... Okay, so I played bishop c4, <clears throat> bishop g7, castles, castles, and now I played a4, a5 plan. So I kind of knew the plan reasonably well, I guess. Um, I, as I was prepared, I think Abi Friedman helped me prepare, but I, I missed that queen a4 opportunity. So king h8, queen e2, f5. Okay, so um, should we take or not take? <clears throat> yes, very good. F3 was the best best move. Um, I took, how should black recapture? With a pawn, of course, right? And uh, the funny thing is for this kind of pawn capture, G takes F5, there's been a saying called, Every Russian schoolboy knows to like take with the G pawn, bolstering the center. And the ironic thing is, he was a Russian schoolboy and he didn't know it. He played bishop makes a five, which I found to be very ironic. Uh, yeah, now, um, because nowadays, of course, people know things much, much better. But back in the day, people didn't have as good of a chess culture, I think, in a way. Because now everybody knows everything. So, uh, okay, now the question is, um, what should white, um, oh, yes, if, if, if G takes a five, white play a four, I mean, he can, but, um, you know, you can play four, position is double-edged, still white could be better, but that's not the point, you know, G takes a five is still the better option of the two. Now, what should white play here? Last important critical moment for today. G4 seems a bit dangerous, a bit weakening. And go bishop e6. All right, Austin's got it, but let's see if anyone else has a suggestion. A5 is what I played. We'll see shortly why it's not as good. H4, H5, I think won't work because I can take queen takes H4. Uh, looks too risky. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so looks like people are are getting it. So yes, the correct move is of course um, F3, and the main reason for that is you're just stopping E4, because E4 is a very important move for him, right? After E4, he activates knight and the bishop, activates his pieces, right? Piece activity in chess is very important. So white plays f3. And then he wants to go bishop d3, bishop e4, a5. You know, white will be strategically winning very soon, right? Of course, black can still try e4, but this is not quite the same thing. I can play bishop d3. 
Um, yeah, I mean, actually, the best move might even be bishop d3. I think bishop d3 is even better, actually, because you're still stopping e4, but you're not even weakening yourself. Yeah, let's just check with the engine very quickly. I think it's actually, yeah, bishop d3 was the best move. Yeah, f3 is the second best move, still better than what I played, but I like bishop d3 even better because now e4 is really not working at all. You, you're going to have to actually trade the bishops off also if you want to weaken my my pawn structure. Um, and otherwise, I'm going to go bishop e4, f3, a5, and I'm just going to have a light square domination and playing against your very bad bishop. Yeah, so bishop d3, I believe, is even better. But either way, you want to try to stop e4, right? Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't even think in that direction. I was only thinking about my idea here. I played a5, and now for e4, the game became complicated. And later on, after some adventures, um, Black made a draw in this game. And uh, so, yeah, this was also a very instructive game. Okay, so I've shown you like maybe five, six, seven of my games when I was a kid, like around 13, 14 years old, 22, 2300 level UCF. Who wants to make some conclusion? Like, let's say you're my coach at that time, and I would show you all these games. What would you tell me as a good coach? Because some of you might be good coaches someday also. So um, what would you guys uh, 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 suggest me to uh, improve on? If you saw such games, or let's say if these are your games, what would you tell yourself that it needs to work on to play better? Okay, work on positional aspect trades, piece activity, very good. Think more positionally. Look at what your opponent's trying to do. Uh, <laughs> well, don't go for cheap tricks. Well, no, I mean that's there's nothing wrong with. It. I mean, if you're losing, you have to try cheap tricks, right? How to like avoid getting a lost position. And suggest improving the positional theory, okay. Uh, don't obscure your vision on the whole board. In other words, don't focus your sides to one board while looking at the entire board. Work on the value of the pieces based on position. Yes, I like that. Calculation and maneuvering. Um, yeah, calculation, I think, was not so bad, these games, but maneuvering for positional play. Yeah, piece activity, very good. Candidate moves, dynamic play, very good. Uh, yeah, positional play. Yeah. Um, Sacrizing stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess I missed the uh, exchange stack in positional one game. Yeah, I would say there are kind of um, a few things. Um, of course, I didn't really value piece activity very much back then. And to some extent, that's still a little bit of my weakness now. Um, I also didn't value strategical things that well, like which pieces to trade. I didn't value the center nearly enough, right? Nobody kind of emphasized, I don't think anyone emphasized that, but the center is the big thing that I didn't really pay enough attention to the center. I would exchange on e5 very easily, right? I would let him play, him play e4. I just didn't appreciate the center. And I didn't even show you like all of the games. There were other games which were like that as well, right? And um, um, yeah, I was a little bit, a little bit yeah. I didn't really think about consequences of trades, right? And uh, yeah, and, and, and you know, there are certainly a lot of other things as well. And I noticed, you know, when I was looking back at these games, I, I, I started to think about my chess now. And I started to realize that to some extent, I have a little bit of these weaknesses even still. Um, you know, because usually whatever you kind of have a problem with as a kid, you know, it's you kind of build a habit. Right, you build a certain habit, and then it's hard to completely um, get rid of it. Right, so that's why if some of you has, let's say, a weakness in chess, let's say it's time pressure or playing too fast, or you know, not thinking about the center or not thinking about pieces or whatever else it may be, if you feel like you have a pattern in your game, so you have a bad habit or something, really try your best to think about it more and work on it. Because if you kind of don't think about it enough now as a kid it might end up kind of becoming a problem as an adult player, which kind of happened um, to me. So basically that's uh, that's the 
that's the idea. Um, and yes, I did make a video, uh, Alex loses sense of danger at the same post just for my greatest losses. The first game was the one against Jay Bonnet where I took an E5, it's early. Anyway, so I hope you guys enjoyed this lesson. I mean, I figured, you know, something a little bit more fun and relatable, you know, and if this was enjoyable, I can do another one similar because I have plenty of more very good examples from, from when I was uh, much weaker <laughs> so that you guys can, <laughs> can kind of make fun of my play. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, next time I'll do more of these games. <laughs> Okay. Okay. See you guys. Bye-bye. Uh...